Welcome to Friday morning's edition of Breakfast Central. Thank you very much for joining us to our viewers here in Nigeria, across the continent and everywhere across the world that you might be watching us this morning. Thank you very much for joining us. We hope that the next two hours we can bring you uh, some of the biggest conversations happening here in Nigeria and in maybe other parts of the continent. I am Osao Gie Ogbonwa. Uh, of course, our first conversation this morning, you know, starts with the news that, of course, or the announcement that the House of Reps has, of course, you know, passed a bill to revert back to Nigeria's old national anthem. It is called Nigeria we hail thee. And of course, there's been many, many reactions from across the country as to why this was necessary and, you know, what, what basically prompted this reversion, you know, this, you know, revert back to the old one. Um, there's many also, you know, um, um, questions that are being asked with regards, you know, the words that are being used, who composed the old national anthem. But most importantly, who asked for this? I mean, again, who asked for this? Uh, because there's many other you know issues that are currently going on in the country there's you know stagnation there is insecurity issues there's failure to increase our, our crude oil production there is corruption there is of course unemployment there is you know uh, you know issues concerning the coastal highway that of course you know we're also going to talk about, about later many many other things and so again who asked you know, that we revert back you know who which people came together and told their representatives in the house of um, you know reps that Oh, we think we would like to go back to the old national anthem. I don't think there's many people who did. And of course, I, I did mention earlier that it was, first of all, composed by a British expatriate who lived in Nigeria in the time just before independence back then. You know, the, the old national anthem was used between 1960 and 1978. It was composed by a lady, a British expatriate, her name Lillian Jean Williams. And um, uh, also um, um, Frances Berda, who composed the music for Nigeria, we hail the, used between 1960 and 1978, and then eventually um, Arizo Compatriots was eventually adopted um, from 1978. Those were composed by Nigerians, and I, I think I could also quickly share their names. Uh, the lyrics are written by John Ilichiku, um, Eme Etim Akban, B.A. Ogunaike, um, and P.O. Aderigbe in 1978. Those are some of the people who wrote the lyrics of our eyes or compatri uh, compatriots. These are some of the things that, of course, are creating conversations across Nigeria today. Um, I'm going to have Olive join us in just a few seconds. And, of course, Judith at TV will also be bringing us um, breakfast headlines. But aside the new national anthem, there's also conversations about the um, lagos Calabar Coastal Highway. If you've been following the news in the last few months, you must have seen the controversy, the chaos, that, are, you know, that, you know, um, uh, this coastal highway conversations brought. The Nigerian government, of course, you know, announced that it was going to be kicking off the project. They went ahead, of course, to demolish uh, properties that were, um, according to them, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, they needed to disrupt, basically, for the project to continue to be a success. If you remember also in the last couple of months, there were loads and loads of people who said that it wasn't necessary to demolish these places because of, of course, I mean, there was a realignment, basically, that made it necessary to demolish those places. There was the environmental impact assessment that was asked for, that wasn't provided, and up to yesterday, it still wasn't provided. The Minister of Works, David Dumahi, of course, um, asked that freedom of, use the Freedom of Information Act as an excuse for the federal government to not provide an you know, EIA assessment, uh, EIA, basically, document for the project. But the question now is, and, and this is what I've seen a lot of people say, you know, they've, you know, I've seen many people say, don't let Nigeria happen to you or don't let Nigeria happen to your business because how do you explain to anybody that the Nigerian government went ahead to demolish the businesses that have been running there for decades, demolish businesses for hundreds of people for a project that eventually has decided to disembark, a project that it has suddenly decided all, you know, out of nowhere, that it was, it's not going to go ahead with that project after demolishing those businesses. And if you, if you have followed the story closely, you must have heard every single time that these conversations came up, people asked, was there an environmental impact assessment document that was done? Because these things are necessary to understand you know, what, what impact this project would, 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 um, um, would make on those areas from Lagos all the way to Calabar. And so if that EIA document was not provided, then it means that the government didn't in any way do any analysis as to what exactly it was about to you know, undertake with that project. There was no analysis whatsoever. 
The excuse that they're giving, of course, is those cables, is the telecoms cables that are on the ground that will be affected. So it means that even when Nigerians were complaining, we had someone who joined us on Breakfast Central I mean, a few weeks ago that spoke about the impact that this would have on those telecom cables. So it means that even when those things were mentioned, the Nigerian government didn't in any way listen to any of those complaints, listen to any of all those views. It went ahead and demolished all those properties only for it to have, you know, weeks later to then say, oh, it's no longer going to be, you know, carrying out that project. It is very, very heartbreaking, you know, and I, I, I wish that I could truly express how hurtful this is to those people whose businesses have been lost, to those people whose livelihoods have been taken away from them, to those people whose investments have been broken down completely because of a highway, and how this really just, you know, shows a government that doesn't listen to anybody but itself, a government that is selfish and th takes zero interest in listening to what other people are saying, you know, I mean, aside what it wants to do. And for those conspiracy theories, you know, that people had mentioned earlier that said that, oh, this project is never going to go anywhere. It's never going to go beyond Lagos. It's never going to go beyond maybe, you know, the Dangote refinery. The Nigerian government continues to prove those people right. That's what it means. That everybody who had pointed out all the while that these conversations were, you know, were ongoing, that this project is a sham. The Nigerian government has proven those people right, somehow, some way. And those who pointed out that there was no need, and I remember that I said it, that there's no need to actually demolish these things. I mean, there's, there has to be a way that these things can coincide. The highway and, of course, the beach you know, resort and every other business that you know, was eventually demolished. So everybody who complained back then turns out to be right. It's a very, very painful morning for a lot of people especially those of course who are affected directly by this but mostly because once again you know this is just a clear sign and a clear you know um, 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 example of how your government doesn't listen to advice i mean it, it, it doesn't in any way take anyone's advice doesn't take you know you know um, even expert advice on any you know project that it wants to to undertake Welcome once again to Breakfast Central. The conversations continue this morning. Just to quickly remind you, you could always be a part of it. Simply tweet at New Central TV and let's know your thoughts on any of the things that we, of course, you know, are discussing this morning on Breakfast Central. Olive, of course, you know, is on uh, with me this morning. Um, so is uh, Judith at TV. Good morning, Judith. Good morning, Olive, and good morning to you, sir. Many thanks, uh, guys, for having me on this morning. Great to see you both. Let me just quickly bring your, you in. You know, let's have your thoughts on you know, the two things quickly. Uh, the new national anthem, well, the old national anthem bring, being brought back, and, of course, the, the uh, coastal highway and the decision to disembark um, on that project. Uh, I look, uh, I, was, I was listening to your monologue earlier on, um, Osa, and, and quite frankly, uh, you make very, very, very pertinent points there. Very valid points were made, and honestly, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it really goes to show that uh, the government, um, they do not, I do not know if they care. It's a, it's a, it's, and I have a theory, right? My theory is this, um, they do not care as they should, you know what I mean, when it comes to governance and democracy. And the very, the, very, uh, the very concerns that the government should be having now is how this message is gonna pass to investors and those who are looking to bring in investment into this, comp into this country in terms of foreign direct investments, and that's FDIs. And so all the business owners who are at the beachfront, so I'm talking the business owners at Landmark, I'm talking Good Beach, all the other beaches who were lined up on that stretch of road, um, they were deaf to their cries. In fact, the, the, the organizers or the owners of Landmark also went into negotiations or, or you know, talks of negotiations with the ministry and even provided options for them to redirect the demolition and the route of the first phase of the Lagos Calabar Coastal Highway. We demanded media and you know, every other you know, concerned stakeholders demanded for the EIA, and that's the Environmental Impact Assessment, None of that was provided. And so it's, it's, um, it's, it's a very, 
the actions of this government is very clear that they do not, whether they care, I do not know. You know, whether they are concerned about what this message says to foreign investors, I do not know. And many of these business owners were people who were in the diaspora. And so it's very, very concerning because Nigerians in diaspora want to come back to invest. And when they try to come back to invest uh, because of expansion, which is necessary, you know, inf infrastructure is necessary, but you didn't bring everybody else to the table to find a way where it suits everyone, where everyone is, you know, put, brought into the table and they are included and they are listened to and they are, and they understood. It's, it's, um, honestly, I, I don't, I don't know the right word to describe it, but, um, it, it passes a message and that message is they do not care. It also, you know, speaks to some level of maybe foul play because uh, we remember the video that went viral where journalists had asked the minister about the EIA um, uh, environmental impact assessment and he said it would be made available to the media. All of a sudden you turn around and you say you cannot make it available citing section 15 subsection B of the Freedom of Information Act. This is a conversation that affects the public. Lots of people have lost their jobs, their source of livelihood, there are, there are places to leave because, of course, the landmark which spearheaded the conversation housed a number of, you know, a number of these people. So I think that it's an important conversation to have. And I, I'm waiting to see what card the government has to play in its defense. And on a much lighter but utterly, I don't know, I don't want to use the word that comes to my mind, but very interesting note. I do not see why it is priority for us to change our national anthem or to revert to the one that was before. And if at all we had to change our national anthem, I said it before, and I'll say it again, Timi Dakolo's Great Nation would have been the best option for a national anthem because now more than ever, Nigerians need hope. We need hope. We have been looking for it. We haven't felt it. And we need to feel that hope again. But yeah. this is a conversation that we'll talk about much later. Uh, Judith, let's have you bring us breakfast uh, headlines. Oliver, moment. I was going to add to that list. Uh, another consideration for uh, the Nigerians... Uh, a uh, 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 national anthem should be Fumi Adams, Nigeria, uh, our beloved country. Interesting one. Okay. Well, as well, well. one of uh, Portable's uh, <laughs> latest tracks to it, then. Um, oh, uh, that's that's wow. great. <laughs> Judith, we'll see you in a bit. And of course, yeah, we'll join you again at nine. Hello and welcome. You're watching uh, the breakfast headlines on New Central TV. I am Judith, a TV. Let's begin our headlines at this hour by telling you that four years after Mohamedou Sanusi II was disposed as the Emir of Kano, Governor Abba Yusuf of Kano State has reinstated him to the throne. Now, this decision followed the Kano State House of Assembly's resolution to dethrone the current Emir and also dismantle the four new Emirates in the state established under a controversial 2019 law. Away from that, President Bola Tinubu has instructed his ministers to present their performance reports to the nation in honor of his first anniversary in office. The announcement was made by the Minister of Information and National Orientation, Mohamed Idris, during a press briefing in Abuja on Wednesday. Meanwhile, the sectorial scorecard has been held in Abuja. Away from that and on to education, President Bola Tinubu has directed a total and comprehensive review of the recently announced governing boards of Treasury institutions before the inauguration and retreat being planned for the nominees. The Ministry of Education had last week released of governing councils for 111 federal tertiary institutions in the country. The list contained names of technocrats, politicians and traditional rulers for 50 universities, 37 polytechnics and 24 colleges of education. And now to the, uh, um, to the Ministry of Works, where the Minister of Works, David Umeyi, on Thursday held a stakeholders meeting to address compensation and environmental issues regarding the Lagos Calabar Coastal Highway project. Now, this is the third stakeholders meeting being held since the announcement of the project after some demolitions were carried out. And on on to press outrage is buring or buring over the arrest of the editor-in-chief of global upfront 
newspaper and online news platform Madu Onora by operatives of the Nigerian police force. Mr. Onora was arrested at his residence in Luba, Abuja, on Wednesday evening in the presence of his wife and children. Reports say the journalist had was handed over to the Luba police station by the operatives who left no trace of where, how, and where they can be located. The trial of detained Binance executive Tigran Gambaran uh, at the uh, Federal High Court in Abuja took a dramatic turn following the defendant's collapse in court on Thursday. At the resumed trial, the defendant failed to enter the dock when he was called upon by the court register for continuation of trial as he remained seated at the back seat. Following the failure of the defendant to enter the dock, the trial judge, Justice Emeka Nwiti, asked after him. Now, one of the lawyers in the defense team assisted Gambaria by the side while holding his hand towards the dock. But as they walked slowly to the dock, he collapsed. Lots of drama there, but that's all on Breakfast Headlines. Back to Osa and Olive. Thank you very much uh, for those stories there. Um, of course, more drama in, in court with the uh, Binance executive. Um, sad to see how these things are playing out, you know, but of course, you know, I think the, um, it, 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 it will uh, play out its, you know, its uh, time. Um, but I want to once again speak about the EIA and the story from the, the Minister of Works. You know, and once again, and, and this is the question that I think that everyone is asking, it's not going to end today or tomorrow or next week. Um, once again, the question is, what do they mean by they are disembarking after destroying those people's properties? Look, um, also... Um, help, help, help anybody make sense of all of this. It's, it's uh, like I said, uh, the message is passed on. There, there's so many angles to this, right? Small businesses, employment, as, as uh, Olive rightfully put as well, investments, you know, um, you know the, 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 the lives of these people, how it's going to impact them, the economic impact of this on the state as well, plus um, uh, 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 the environmental factors in terms of climate change, losing our waterfronts, wildlife that see see wildlife as well there's there so many impacts to that and the me. fact that this if they are halting on this will they continue constructions in all of these other states that we also they're going is going to go because it's just the first phase guys they're going to five more other states as well you know and those are you know the deforestation is going to come in falling of trees is going to come in people are going to lose their properties lose I mean, their businesses know, we can go on and on about you know how this looks not just or how it has impacted nigerians but also how it looks to foreign investors. We're sending a message of uh, being a country that takes a move and then thinks about it after, right? And, and it's not looking good. But we'll keep talking about this, Judith. Thank you very much for bringing us breakfast headlines. We'll see you at 9 a.m. You're welcome. And now let's get into the meat of the conversation today. Remember, you can join us. A tweet at New Central TV. And at some point when we open the phone lines, you can call in and share your thoughts on any of the stories we'll be taking. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission says that it is ready to commence the trial of former Minister of Aviation, Hadi Sirika. The FCC made this known following the arraignment of the former minister and his brother before the FCT High Court on an amended 10-count charge bordering on contract fraud to the tune of about 19 billion naira. The former minister was granted bail by the trial judge, Justice Suleiman Belgori, and the case was adjourned to May the 28th and 29th for trial. Mavelo Subomanu tells us more. At the Federal Capital Territory High Court, the former Minister of Aviation, Hadi Sirika, and his brother, Ahmed Abubakar, were arraigned before Justice Suleiman Belgore to answer to an amended 10-count charge, bordering on allegations of fraud to the tune of about 19 billion naira. <laughs> The 
This is coming less than a week after the anti-corruption agency arraigned the former minister alongside his daughter, Fatima, and her husband on charges of abuse of office in awarding contracts. At the arraignment, the counsel to the former aviation minister sought the order of the court to grant him bail, as earlier granted by a sister court in Maitama with the same bail conditions. Counsel to the anti-graft agency, who did not object to the bail application, argued that both the former charge and the amended one are totally different. The charge before this court is totally different from that other court. The one before the other court relates to some different defendants. The only common defendant is the first defendant, Adi Abubakar Serika. The remaining defendants in this one are totally different from the remaining defendants in the sister charge. The transactions in this one are totally different from the transactions in the other one. Counsel to the defendant, who said he is pleased with the outcome of the arraignment, expressed readiness to commence the trial of the former minister. It went well, applications were granted, and uh, as you witness in the court, the ruling was apt and was detailed. Uh, we can see the excitement on the part of the prosecution to, to proceed with their case. We're equally very ready to put our defense before the courts. Having considered the bail application, both the prosecution and the defendant have expressed willingness to commence the trial, which will begin on the 28th and 29th of May. In Abuja for News Central, Marvelous Obomman. Thank you very much, Marvelous, for that update. Of course, it's still an ongoing case. They have expressed willingness to commence trial. And as we proceed with the case, we'll be providing more details here on Breakfast Central. Now let's move on to another story. The Central Bank of Nigeria has directed rude exchange operators to reapply for new licenses. This was revealed on Wednesday in a revised guideline for BDC operations, signed by the Director of the Financial Policy and Regulation Department, Aruna Mustafa. The CBN also directed that BDCs meet the minimum capital requirements for the license category applied for within six months from the effective date of the guidelines. The new guidelines permit uh, Tier 1 BDCs to operate across all 36 states and the FCT and to open franchises nationwide with CBN approval. The updated regulations also prohibit BDCs from engaging in futures, options and derivative trading, uh, performing outward international transfers, receiving international inward transfers and dealing in crypto assets with entities that handle crypt crypto assets, assets I beg your pardon, among other restrictions. All right. Um, that's the update that we have regarding the BDCs. Uh, we, of course, uh, have seen that there have been increments from all the levels from Tier 1 uh, BDC operators. And this is, of course, happen happening across all 36 states. We'll be bringing more updates as we have regarding that. But we're going to break now. When we come back, we're looking into more stories this morning on Breakfast Central. In celebration of his first year in office, President Bola Tinubu has instructed his ministers to share their performance reports with the public. The Minister of Information and National Orientation, Mohamed Idris, announced at a press briefing in Abuja on Wednesday that the modest first anniversary celebration will feature sectoral media briefings by the 47 federal ministers beginning on the 23rd of May. Adiza Bala Usman, the President's Special Advisor on Policy Coordination and Head of the Central Delivery Coordinating Unit, confirmed that the unit had received performance reports from at least 20 of the 35 ministries. She noted that the assessment report would be the result of a collaborative effort involving the ministers, citizens and industry experts. We're joined this morning by Ayodele Adio, who is a media strategist, uh, to of course have conversations uh, surrounding this. Good morning, Ms. Adio. Good morning. Thank you for having me. 
Um, so before we get into the conversation on the one-year uh, performance review of the ministers, let's first of all get you to talk about Landmark and the um, lagos Calabar Coastal Highway, the decision to disembark, you know, of course, you know, because of the submarine cables that they, you know, realized, you know, were there and they didn't want to disrupt um, weeks after people had warned, you know, about this. Um, and of course, you know, the lack of the EIA, you know, um, document and all of that. So let's get your thoughts on that, first of all. I mean, first, I, I believe that you were as embarrassed as I was um, watching that town hall yesterday. Because for, in the first instance, the reason why EIAs are mandated to be done with every project of, of that scale is to prevent the very thing that they are trying to do um, at this very instance. So it, it begs the question why many of these basic procedures were circumvented in the very first instance. Um, that project never got approval from the National Assembly. Um, the funds did not come based on an approval from the National Assembly with very little oversight. There was very little, if any at all, competitive bidding. And just as there wasn't any EIA, environmental impact assessment. Uh, and so you wonder what um, the hurry was with embarking on a project that lacked the basic, the basic, you know, scrutiny and transparency that you would expect for a project that was going to cost um, over 15 trillion, you know. So it, it's quite laughable the way that we govern here in Nigeria. And you see, when we made the argument at the time that you know, you can save businesses and you can save jobs simply by following, you know, the earlier route that actually boycotted the destruction of many of the businesses along that particular corridor. Um, and whatever the cost it was going to be, you would have been able to save jobs. You would have been able to save what is a major part of Lagos and Nigeria's tourism industry. And you would have been able to inspire confidence in the business community. But unfortunately, you know, the arrogance of, of senior government officials, the, the arrogance and their law of power just makes them not to listen. And, and I think that the fundamental problem here is that it appears that you have a lot of people in government, in senior positions in government, who really haven't built an enterprise before, who really do not understand what the average business owner in Nigeria has to go through to build successful businesses. And so they do not have problems tearing down or destroying businesses at the slightest of opportunity because really and truly, many of them really have no idea or clue what it means to build successful businesses. Just very little have had that very, very, very important privilege. And so I'm saddened as, as I always am, about a group of political elites who have no respect for businesses, who have no respect for the rule of law, and who seem to be antithetical to, to due process. And, and that's what you find yourself in, in situations like this, where you have to look, you know, completely clueless, like you didn't know what you were doing in the first instance, because you simply refuse to follow basic um, laid down procedures. And I think this still ties to the conversation about, you know, looking at the ministers and their one year in office. Dave Omahi, the Minister of Works, this is the biggest story that we've seen in his time in office so far. Uh, we, I, I'm sure you have also seen the clip where he was being asked about the environmental impact assessment uh, and he said he was going to make it available. And now he's turned around to say that he will not be making it available to the public. What do you think that this whole landmark situation conveys what message is it sending to foreign investors not just to nigerians we've seen the impact it's having on nigerian businesses but what message are we sending to investors especially because we're uh, our economy and where we are right right now we're so keen every other day our, our president is either traveling or having a meeting to move foreign investors but with this action what message are we conveying well i mean again like i always say you have a group of people who haven't really managed real businesses and so do not understand the optics, the implication of some of these optics. And I'll, and I'll help, you know, try to make the point as simple as I can. The reality is, you know, what you're projecting to the international community 
is that you're a country that one seems to have very little or no rights for property the second is that you have no respect for businesses and you have no intention whatsoever to protect businesses in your country the third is that you are saying that you have very weak judicial institutions and fourthly is that you're saying there is very very little um, social contract between citizens and, and and those that they elect now these four things send a message to international organizations, multinationals, and businesses that doing business in your country is highly risky. And it's highly risky because they cannot see any effort that the government makes in one, trying to protect businesses, two, in making businesses, you know, have the kind of environment that they require to thrive, and three, that there are very little policies in place that support growth, skill, and sustainability of many of these businesses. And so it's almost impossible um, to see any, any serious business organization try to set shop in Nigeria because of all this obvious reality. And it's important to note that when people talk about capital coming into the country, it is hot capital which is portfolio investments that has nothing to do with creating local jobs or stimulating local economy because real businesses i mean you followed the news um you know the of of, of the oil company that really the total energies that set up shop um in a different african country and simply boycotted us after having talks for a very long period of time i think yesterday i was reading the news and over two billion of investments was just secured in kenya um, and you see different kinds of investments moving into various African countries, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Kenya. Um, of course, you know, South Africa has always been a huge magnet for global businesses. But the reality is the decisions that we continue to make, especially at the highest level of government, shows a lot of hostility for businesses and makes it almost impossible for well-meaning businesses to attempt to make yeah. any reasonable investments in our country and that uh, and that really and truly does a lot of damage to our yes. economy yes. and our ability i, I, to I agree with world. that you know I, I think you can also tell from their attitude when these um, companies decide to leave nigeria there's nobody who, who even chases after them to try to convince them to stay they, they just ignore that exactly but let, exactly. let's move on and talk about the performance reviews now um uh, the president of course you know has had that decision to have his ministers present their performance um, um reviews um, some would say that this is showing transparency and accountability in government. Do you agree with that? Do you also think one year is enough? Do you think this is all just, you know, a waste of time? Okay, I mean, one year is enough to present your scorecards to the Nigerian people. There's no doubt about it. One year is truly and well enough to present your scorecards. Now, again, you ask the second question, which is, you know, is this some sort of charade? Now, you can look at it at two ways. You, you can call it a charade and you can be right. And in another vein, you can call it some sort of accountability to the Nigerian people to have, you know, a glance of the people who are leading the various ministries and assess them for themselves and see the work that they have been doing to make their lives better and to make their country better. <laughs> so you can view it from that vantage point and say it's, 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 it's a means or it's a sort of way um, to hold those in these positions accountable because they are essentially presenting their scorecards to the public. But the truth is, the buck has to still stop at the president's table because the president appointed each and every one of these ministers, albeit recommended by state governance or party leaders. But he eventually appointed all of these ministers into office. And he, at the end of the day, um, would have to defend their successes or failures um, in his re-election in two, three years. Nobody will remember the minister that had failed in office, but everybody will remember a president that failed to live up to the promises he made to the Nigerian people. Now, the third question which you asked, um, the assessment of the ministers generally, I mean, I think that's as clear as daylight that the ministers that have been charged with the responsibility of implementing the policies of the president or to achieve or help the president achieve his hope agenda objective seem to be falling short of the mark. 
The reality today is that you can't pick more than five ministers who are really who are really doing all they can to help the president achieve those objectives. Many of these ministers, you can't even recall their names. Many of them seem to be on sabbatical. Others seem to be on some sort of holiday. But really and truly, there's very little progress in the last one year that you can hold on to, to inspire hope and to inspire confidence that Nigeria is going to get out of this very difficult economic situation that we found ourselves in. And the truth is, while you can hold these ministers to account, many of whom have performed spectacularly poorly over the last one year, you also have to take a look at the president who appointed these individuals um, and ask the question, um, you know, his, his, his judgment in deciding these individuals to man these ministries. And, and quite fr frankly, to also ask the question, if really and truly he thinks that these individuals can help him achieve his agenda, of if there's clearly any sense of direction to achieve what has been printed on paper and promised to the Nigerian people. All right. Um, let's look at the one-year administration of President Bola Metinumbu. Yesterday at the Ministerial Sectoral Update, uh, the, the Minister of the FCT, Nyesom Wiki, said that President Tinumbu has restored hope in the hearts of Nigerians. Is this a statement that you would agree with? How would you score President Bola Metinumbu's first year in office? Well, listen, politicians will always sing praises to their political leaders. And that's that's what they do. That's what they'll continue to do. But the Nigerian people who live and experience the policies um, of government would have a different story to tell and have a different song to sing. Now, I'm not going to make an argument, a broad or a sweeping generalization of whether or not the president has performed um, poorly or badly in the last one year, I'd like to focus on the evidence that are hardly disputable to the Nigerian people. And we can all make our judgments based on the evidences that are available to the Nigerian people. The evidence today suggests that we have over 40% of food inflation. The evidence today suggests that we have record headline inflation, the highest we've experienced since perhaps 1996. The evidence suggests that our economy has shrunk um, if you do a comparative analysis in the last decade. The evidence suggests that the average purchasing power of the Nigerian has weakened. Data suggests that over a thousand manufacturing businesses have shut down. The data suggests, obviously, that a lot of small businesses have folded up because they are grappling with high energy costs, whether it's electricity, whether it's petrol, whether it's diesel. The data also suggests that the house, um, uh, you know, house uh, living income crisis has worsened across many cities, you know, in the country. So when you look at these, these facts and these evidences stacked before you, it is almost impossible to make a logical argument in favor of the government in power as we speak. Unemployment has worsened, just as poverty has also worsened. You know, the, the, the saddest part of it all is that if you put 10 economists together today as we speak, none of them will be able to articulate clearly the economic direction of this administration. And that is the most worrying of it all. There's been a lot of policy somersaults there's been very poor, clear thinking. There's been a lack of coherence in policy implementation. And it's just been top sea turvy. It's just been hazard, haphazard um, in the last one year. Decision is yeah. taking today. It is reversed seven days from now. Um, we seem to be putting the cart before the horse in many instances. Uh, yeah. it, it's just Mr. very Adio, easy. It's truly very easy. Mr. Adio, have you seen this happen, you know, anywhere else? where we have an event for everyone to present their own scorecard, you know, to the president and the vice president. I, I mean, I mean, this is new, you know, for, for my, I don't know if it's happened anywhere else. So it, have you seen it happen anywhere else? And I, do you think it's even necessary? Or should Mr. President already have his own metrics with which he rates the performance of these people? And should, you know, by impulse decide when or, or if, you know, um, to keep them or not. 
Well, to be honest, I, I'm not sure that it's such an absurdity to have ministers present their scorecards because if we run a parliamentary system of government where ministers are actually members of parliament, you would have had a situation where you see ministers defend their scorecards in parliament, right? Just like you have in the British parliament and in other government, in other countries that run a parliamentary system of government. So it's not such an absurdity to see ministers present their scorecard you know, before the public. It may be a bit of an anomaly in a presidential system, you know, of government where usually the head of government, which is the president, is the one that typically, um, you know, defends his scorecard before the, the, the citizens of that particular country and in our case in Nigeria. So it, it's not such an anomaly. The problem here, obviously, is that you cannot have watched what occurred yesterday in that the so-called ministerial briefing and have confidence that we're headed in the right direction. You could not have paid rapt attention to many of, you know, what was said by many of these ministers and believe truly that the objective of the president is being implemented and if and, there's any hope that and, that objective... And that's, that's why I'm asking, and that's why I mentioned earlier, you know, that does Mr. President have metrics with which he rates these, you know, ministers? Does he have set goals with which he would rate the, the Minister for Power, the Minister for Health? I mean, do, are there certain things that he wants to see done in a one-year time frame or two-year time frame with which he can say to the Minister of Power that I, I don't think you're getting it right and you maybe should step down for somebody else? Or are we just going to have mean, the same dance? I mean... We would have to ask um, Hadiza Bala Osman that question, if there are clear metrics that the president intends to use to, to rate the performances of his ministers. Hadiza will be in a better position to answer that question, uh, and maybe the Minister for Information. But th the reality is, whether or not the president has that particular metric in place, the Nigerian people who feel the pulse of the policies that have been implemented by this administration already have passed a judgment of the governance they've experienced in the last one year. If you travel from Kanu to Abekuta, you know, from Karanamoda to Enugu, there is a unanimity that Nigerian people have gotten extremely poorer, that there's a lot of pressure on businesses across the country, there's a lot of apprehension. There's a lot of hopelessness from millions of Nigerians. There's a lot of young Nigerians trying to flee the country. Uh, uh, that's the reality. You, you can't run away from this reality that millions of Nigerians are hungry. Um, over 5 million Nigerians are at the brink of starvation as we speak. Um, there's an energy crisis. I mean, there's this insecurity plaguing the country. You, you have a situation where 500 people can be kidnapped you know, in broad daylight without the slightest of resistance from security agencies. And mind you, I think it's important to stress the fact that because the economy has been so bad, because people have been struggling to feed and to survive, a lot of attention has been taken away from how bad insecurity or how, how insecurity yeah. has worsened over the last one year. There's kidnappings every day. There are killings every day. I mean, it, it's, it's just very uninspiring. And, and I hope it, that... It's something that's happening in you know, different sectors, uh, Mr. Adu. Education, we're looking at healthcare, insecurity, the economy, the quality of life of the average Nigerian. There's too many angles to look at that we cannot, unfortunately, cover in this conversation. But on the 29th of May, we have a special broadcast where we are going to be attempting to delve into some of these uh, areas and these sectors a lot more, uh, a lot deeper. But we've run out of time for this particular conversation. Mr. Ayo Adio, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking thank with you. Thank you. It's good to have you. Welcome back. And now let's take you through the newspapers this morning, share with you the major stories, making headlines across Nigeria. Remember, you could join us and uh, share your thoughts with us via our phone lines, which will be shared on uh, the screen in just a few seconds. We're going to kick off with this Nigerian newspapers this morning to see what the major stories are over there. It says there, sad day for Ganduje, I'm not sure why, as Lamido Sanusi returns to Kano throne. If you remember uh, the, well, the MI of Kano uh, 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 Sanusi Lamido, the, of course, former central bank governor, 
um, was removed as MRF Kano a few years ago. And um, it, he has now just been reinstated. It says Governor Yusuf abolishes five Emirate Councils, sacks uh, the MRs, and um, ancient city calm reinstated monarch back in palace today. Even if I have also seen news reports or updates, you know, saying that there might be a court uh, case uh, uh, that of yeah, course the court has, has stopped, um, its, stopped his reinstatement yeah, back as uh, MR of Canada. So, you know, there's, there's going to be obviously developments to this. Um, it's obviously politics that is, you know, being played with um, the, uh, the uh, Emirates in Kano State. Um, everyone had pointed this out, you know, a couple of years ago when this happened. Also this morning, Tinubu Star Minister Wike dazzles all with account of stewardship. Free two months train ride for Abuja residents from May 29th. Alake, Lopo Biri, Aldo, others present ministry scorecards. Also, the government incurred 628 billion naira as electricity subsidy in 2023, says NERC. Alleged lopsidedness, federal government orders review of composition of tertiary institutions governing councils. Um, these are the major stories on this Nigeria. I think, you know, the big one obviously is the, you know, I mean, recent drama with the reinstatement of um, uh, Sanusi Lame as the, um, yeah. the Emir of Kano. You know, and of course, what this means for the five Emirates, you know, that have now been abolished, you know, by Governor Yusuf. Why um, um, Abdullahi Ganduje's name is being mentioned, you know, of course, he was the one who was a governor when uh, Sanusi Lamido was uh, kicked out as Emir of Kano back then. So it's just a lot of drama, and I'm not sure exactly how this would eventually uh, play out. But it's obviously, like I said, politics that is being infused into traditional leadership in parts of the country. And of course, you know, mostly in Kano State. It's first of um, all, even going back to why he was dethroned in the first place. Yes. What exactly happened? Typically, the government and traditional rulers work hand in hand. And it's almost like, even though, yes, their, their institutions are interwoven, but they, they sort of run in a way somewhat separately. Like, so why was he dethroned in the first place? There were reasons that were cited, you know, but but the reasons sort sort you know there, there were some maybe underlying reasons that were not so very overt. So maybe political reasons that make made Ganduje do what he did then. So yes, you're very right. What happens to the other the other um, uh, uh, what do we call them now? The Emirate Councils yeah. who have been asked to vacate office in 48 hours. What happens to them? But then again, the new update to the court stalling it, you know, it, it just puts a new twist to the story. And we, of course, we keep following up. And I, I think it's very interesting. Uh, Wiki dazzles all with account of stewardship. Tinubu star minister. I, I wonder if the whole of Nigeria thinks Wiki is Tinubu's star minister. Because uh, Wiki, for the most part, yes, he's been doing work in Abuja or in the FCT. But I think that the most... Uh, the most mention of his name that a number of Nigerians have heard this year would be regarding the chaos that's been happening in River State. Yes, he's talked about how he cannot solve the problem of the FCT, even if the, the, the problem of the FCT is something that he can't, he can't turn around overnight. In his words, you know, he, I think he said something about not being able to turn it around in 200 years or something like that. I, I don't want to even... Him, well, the FCT is not necessarily, you know, Gotham. It, no, it's it, it not. doesn't have. But insecurity was one of the key issues he talked about. He said, yes, it's not completely sorted, and that right now, uh, it's not as bad as it was before. He said, before people could barely sleep every night, there were reports of insecurity. That, yes, it's not completely over because there is no nation or city that is void of criminality but that the criminal elements have gravely reduced in comparison to what it was. But I can't say. It's the citizens in the FCT that can tell us. So yep. would you say that since Nelson Wike became the minister of the FCT that there's been considerable improvement with the insecurity challenges in Abuja? Let us know. Tweet at New Central TV. would love to see your tweets and maybe take them. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, for me, right, you know, I always question what, what the standard is with which we rate performance. What are the, the metrics with which we would say that a governor has performed well? And, you know, it's mostly based on what the average Nigerian knows, the level of exposure that the average Nigerian has with regards to development. When we celebrate an FCT minister or a governor um, for things like 
you know, five roads were built and, you know, these, you know, bridges were, you were, were fixed and, and this and that. And we, we as a people cannot put together, you know, and I'm not talking about developmental metrics now, human capital development. In, in what ways has the presence of this person in government improved on, you know, businesses, improved on the livelihood of citizens, improved on healthcare, improved on education metrics and, and all of those things? in four years or in eight years. Um, again, I feel it's really, really dependent on the level of exposure and what we are used to as Nigerians. And that's why we celebrate some of these things because these people have, I mean, yes, Wiki has been governor before. In what ways is River State better than it was years ago? And it's not just because of roads. There has to be other things that will be looked at that we can say, okay, the people now want to be in River State because yeah. of this person. Life is now richer in this place because of this person's governance. And it's not because building roads are bad. Yes, it's, good. it's okay to build roads. It's also okay to fix infrastructure. But it, it, I feel like we just belittle the standard so much that the person steps in and does the barest minimum. And we, you know, we, we celebrate it. Because where does he want to see the FCT in four years? Where does he want to see the FCT in eight years? I'm hoping that that's sort of what, that what they will show us. I agree with you. Like, I, I don't think, I mean, when we were talking about this earlier with Ayo and you were saying the governor, the president should have his metrics for determining how they have performed. I do think that the essence of the president appointing these people to be his ministers is because he cannot have, he cannot be the one to dream up a future of, oh, this is what I want the power sector to look like, this is what I want the minister. I think they have a collective dream of, okay, this is where we want Nigeria to be. All of us, let's work together. They would have had meetings and said, okay, you, this is what you are bringing to the table. This is how your own part in ensuring that this renewed hope agenda comes alive. This is what you're doing in the power sector. This. So, I, and I know all of this falls back on President Bola Metinubu's table. But the reason he appointed these people in the first place is because they are meant to be able to show up in these different capacities, to be like the, the eight legs of the, what's that animal in the water, right? The octopus. octopus. Handling different things, he can't handle everything at the same time. What it then behoves on them to actually go, on, go through with this assessment. They allegedly, I think, signed a bond. According to Hadiza, last year she announced that they're going to sign a bond with the president. And as a general this year, announced that anyone who doesn't, who hasn't, you know, stood up to or who hasn't met up with their plans or what they, they had promised to be let go. It will it would be a reflection of lack of integrity if they don't let some people go. Because it's not just about like we, we said earlier, and I I you did say this, there's some people that we haven't heard of ever since their inauguration into the cabinet. You know, we haven't heard of heard of their names, we don't know what they're up to. So if after one year you can't show working, you can't show that this is what you've been able to, this is what you set out to achieve, then there's no point being there. So, so this is, I, I don't know if, if I'm maybe not expressing it well, and I, I understand you. There is, for example, maternal mortality. We can say that in two years we reduce infant and maternal mortality in these regions by... 7%. So that's the Minister of Health by, and Commerce. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, just as, an, yeah. As, as an example. That as a result of these things that we did, we've reduced infant and maternal mortality by 27%, for example. We've reduced, you know, the number of people who die from, you know, as, from um, you know, road accidents by a certain percentage. So that's the impact that I'm talking about when we say that we want to do you know, when we're celebrating ministers, if we say that many years after, and many, many people might not like this example, but I'll still say it, many years after Peter Obi left as governor of Anambra State, it is still the state that continues to have really, really high ratings with regards to its, its um, 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 children um, in schools. And their results in JAM and the results in WAIC and results in, in, you know, every other, you know, major exam happens in Nigeria. You still see people from, or students from Anambra breaking records. So those are some of the things that we should be able to point out and say, okay, this is what we achieved in healthcare, in security, in infrastructure, in housing. Who is talking about housing? Who is talking about jobs? Right. 
Anyway, anyway, that's why they should have come to the table in the first place with a, a plan. But we're waiting to see what the scorecard has to show. Let's go to the Punch newspaper. On the front page of the Punch, Lagos Calabar Highway, 750 houses for demolition as property owners allege poor compensation. Tinubu to flag off Project Sunday, Ministry to demolish buildings based on Gazette. IOC is to invest $20 billion in Nigeria, according to the federal government. 50 firms may produce military weapons, locally, says the minister. NNPC partners deploy electric vehicle charging stations. Grandma buries 17-year-old daughter's newborn alike. I, I cannot make sense of this story. Like, make it make sense. Oh, my goodness. 19.4 billion naira fraud. Sirica brother get 200 million naira bail. Kanu Emirate gov governor reinstates Sanusi after four-year deposition as As Assembly Sachs emirs. Yusuf orders deposed emirs to vacate official residences and palaces in 48 hours. Asu protests, Tinumbu orders review of varsity governing councils. If you recall, uh, part of what they were asking was that the governing council be reinstituted and what the uh, federal government did was instituting new people in the governing council and they're saying, no, we already had people that were there. The people you've removed before, put them back and now the president has uh, ordered the review of the Varsity Governing Councils. Uh, just to quickly touch on this uh, Lagos Calabar Highway coastal region, we're seeing here that according to the reports, if they go by the new alignment, there are going to be 49 houses will be demolished and uh, 70, 750 houses would, uh, following the Gazette alignment, 70, 750 houses will be demolished. They said there is no change of alignment, but that they are following the Gazetted alignment, meaning that there will be a realignment at Okwaja area of the state by 25 kilometers to avoid damaging submarine cables. So at the end of the day, it's a reflection of what is important. They have seen that the submarine cables are important. So they are finding a way to navigate around it, which so is again, what Nigerians were no asking. In, in Ever, exactly. That's what it means. That's what Nigerians were Did you do a feasibility study to see how this would impact businesses? Did you do a study to see how it will impact, ca impact cables? We had uh, um, someone from the technology space join us, uh, I think, last week yes. to talk about how it would hit telecoms really badly. And, and obviously, that went to show that they had no impact assessment, no meeting with stakeholders in the, in the telecom sector. And so, because it's Nigeria, right, you don't expect that there would be any consequence for this level of failure. For a person to make this type of mistake that has led to the demolition of a hundred million dollar property and, and businesses worth hundreds of millions of, of, of dollars for a person to have you know had this level of error in judgment and not gone through the process that you normally should go through that has led to this level of chaos it normally should in a in a sane society people should lose their jobs well, I, I, I really do want to hear, I, I wish we could have the, the minister on the show because I want to hear what the argument is. You know, if it, they would say that it's not a mistake, it was a part of the plan, but it was an original plan. Why did you deviate from the original plan? Why, ca why can't you show Nigerians what the environmental... If, the, if, if you have nothing to hide, you share the information. This is an information that affects the public. People have lost their jobs. Investments have been destroyed. A number of people will lose their source of livelihood because of these demolitions. People will lose their places of abode. So why are you quoting Freedom of Information Act and telling us that you can't share the results of the environmental impact, as, uh, impact yeah. assessment? It just reeks of foul play. And it's not Absolutely. A and like Ayo Adio said, there was not a proper bidding process. The importance of the project generally was questioned. The whole, you know, the, the steps and stages that normally every project of this magnitude should go through. It this didn't one go didn't through go through. And it then gives strength to all the the controversies that have been springing up regarding the role that the Shaguri group have to pay, play in all of this. And, you know, it makes all those things now start to look in some measure like there's an element of, of sense truth, right. or truth to this. Yeah. I mean, but I'm sure that this conversation will happen all through the weekend, even through, you know, till next week. But once again, do you expect... That when a person makes this types of this type of error, an error of this magnitude, do you expect that people would be fired? Yeah, the one that is because even that there's in, an in, error. In, in the, they don't believe they've committed that's an error. That's the problem. So, so because even in the corporate world, right? If I work for a beverage company, for example, and we're about to carry out a project for this beverage company that leads us to destroy one of our plants somewhere in the southwest. 
two weeks after destroying that plant, you then realize that, oh, if we had simply done a very, very basic analysis, we shouldn't have destroyed this plant that has cost the company now 50 billion naira. Shouldn't I be fired? Well, you should. I, I will not uh -huh. be fired in Jesus' name. You know <laughs> but the, the, the point is, <clears throat> for such an error, sh a, people should lose their jobs. But because, and the, there's this theory is getting popular, that we have people in government that haven't really, they've never built anything. And so it's easy for them to destroy, knowing that there's no consequence for destruction. And that's ex that for me is what I see playing out here, that there's no consequence for destruction. It doesn't affect you personally, and so you can destroy it and no know that there is no consequence because these people haven't actually built anything. businesses of that magnitude or built anything of that magnitude. They've been politicians all their lives, and so their decisions are easy to make when it's time to destroy things. Pretty much the same thing with what happened in Lagos when they were destroying, you know, uh, proper, um, 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 properties for, uh, I, I don't remember, we spoke about it a couple of weeks ago. Let's move on to something else. I also want to quickly speak on the IOCs to invest $20 billion in Nigeria, says the federal government. I'm raising that because I, I mentioned yesterday that there was a story about Total Energies leaving yeah, Nigeria to move to the investment Angola. to Angola. Yeah. Right? And so when the federal government makes these types of bold claims... Isn't it easy for every, anyone to just point to one that is about to leave? I spoke about this earlier also that the Nigerian government has not been able to convince anybody who has packed you know, up shop and is ready to leave Nigeria. They've not been able to convince any of them to stay. Like we have a government that sees that this company that is worth hundreds of millions of dollars or even a billion dollars is about to close shop and leave your country. And you do not have anything to say to these people to say, stay. What are the issues that you are dealing with? What are the challenges that you have doing business in Nigeria? We want you to stay, like Rihanna. What, <laughs> what are the challenges that you have? Is it an electricity problem? Is it a security issue? Is it an infrastructure problem? No, you know why they're not going after them? Because they realize that the problems that these investors will talk about, they don't have the solution to it. So it's just like saying, you know the way they say that the broom they used to sweep away the first wife is hanging somewhere to sweep away the second wife. You already know that these problems are there. Security is still a problem. Power is still a problem. So even when you are bringing fresh investors, the other ones are just looking at them. They're okay. Who no go, no go, no. You go there and you'll experience yourself. So they don't even have a way out to sort out the problems for these investors. Listen, I agree. I just feel like it's important to point out the arrogance with the, the arrogance in the government. <clears throat> that <clears throat> when companies claim to want to leave the United States, <clears throat> both you know local companies, international companies, you can see the difference in attitude. You can see that Donald Trump back then would do his absolute best to fight. If they have to change laws, if they have to improve on reduce taxes, if they have to make adjustments with their policies to ensure that these companies stay, they will do it. But when companies say that investing in Nigeria has been so treacherous and we don't think we can do this anymore, we're taking our $10 billion investment elsewhere, then the government has no answer no. For, for this. Well, they have no response. Is it, sorry, at least is it? Yeah, $20 billion is coming. That's what I'm saying. So when you see things like this, I don't have any faith in this. this we don't is, know how long they're going to be here for, if they eventually come. How long they're going to be here for. How I don't think anybody's coming. Be... That's my point. Anyway, let's move on to the next paper. Uh, let's look at the Daily Trust newspaper on the front page of the or Daily Independent newspaper. Federal government lists oil sector achievements, targets $20 billion investment this year. Says it has made Nigeria a big draw for global investors. I pray detail how. Tinubu laying solid foundations to reduce cost of living. I hope that after laying the foundation, they can start to build very quickly. Because it's really rainy season. We need to start building before the rain starts to kick in. Nigerians are, are getting, kick, getting kicked in the back. Sacked staff engaged in $600,000 ticket racketeering, according to Turkish Airlines. You see that Turkish Airlines conversation? Let's leave it for another day. Alleged 19.4 billionaire fraud, ex-aviation minister Sirica 
brother reigned, get 100 million naira bill each. I won't stop contesting presidency for as long as I'm healthy, says Atuku. I, I really can't believe he said that. Anyway, that's on page six. Tinubu should tell Nigerians true position of things, says Bode George on page six. Also, just to mention that we have an exclusive on uh, on the 29th of May that you might want to tune in for. We urge you to tune in as we'll be discussing with some very important uh, thinkers and in industry stakeholders, uh, those who will share their thoughts on uh, the economy and how far we've fared in Nigeria in the past one year. Bode George being one of them. We are committed to efficiency in tax collection, not increasing burden of Nigerians, according to Shetima. PDP reps accuse Damagon of plot to reinstate pro wiki lawmakers in rivers into party. The poll Sanusi returns to the throne as Emir of Kano. Now, mind you, this was printed before the latest update being that the court has set a clog in that wheel. House of Reps orders military to open Banex Plaza. Banex Plaza is another conversation in uh, Abuja. Reps pa pass bill to revert to old national anthem. Senate refers 1960 anthem to committee. And final story, Tinubu orders review of governing councils of tertiary institution after protest. We have a call from William from Abuja. Good morning, William. Thank you for calling. Please go ahead with your comment. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Please go ahead. We can hear you. Yeah, please. Um, for me, I think it's very easy. We don't need to hide anything to tell ourselves the truth. The truth is this. We have people that are not prepared for governance. They are only prepared. They are only trying to get power. They've gotten the power and they are messing up the entire nation. For me, if the Honorable Minister of Works is a man of integrity and a man of that has uh, some kind of decorum, I believe Yesterday, he's not supposed to only apologize. If I were him, I would resign. Because the total issue of the coastal road, everybody knows that it's almost a shady deal. Something without bidding, something that everybody knows due process was not followed. Everybody was asking about the EIA. I remember one of the ladies, the first time they made an inquiry, was asking him, and he pretended as if he could not understand her. So please, for me, let's be honest with ourselves. We only have people that are grumbling for power, but they don't care about the masses. That's for me the way I feel. And the second thing is the issue of telling us that we are expecting twenty billion naira, twenty billion dollars. Please have it first before you announce it to us, because we are tired of rhetoric. We've been hearing this in the last six, seven months. This investment is coming, and let's begin to look at it. When they came back from Dubai, they told us this, 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 this is coming. We've not seen a single dime. When they came back from Saudi Arabia, the same thing they told us. So please, only when they have something tangible at hand, let them tell us, then we can accept it. And the third one is the CBN telling us that over one thirty-six percent increment over like the first quarter of last year. Can you tell us the figures? We are all tired of this, please. We want the nation to work, but all of us must come to deck and tell ourselves the reality. Nobody is saying you have the magic wand, but we know it takes process. But let's be honest and be sincere so that we can work together. We are looking forward for a very good Nigeria that we can all be proud of. But for me, these people, I don't think they are ready. Thank you very much, William, for sharing your thoughts. And he's you know, talked about something very key. We like to announce our victories before they even come. And because it's happened more than once where we announce something and see that it doesn't come into fruition, Example would be the Emirates situation the first time, right? There's a breach of trust, and that's just one of many. There's a breach of trust between Nigeria's government and the people, almost in a way that, when you know the way, it reminds me of childhood when you want to go out, and your father says, go and bring your slippers, you come out and they're gone. So they have disappointed Nigerians over and over and over again, such that even when there is some element of truth to what is being said, and they say that they will do this, or this has been expected, Nigerians don't trust them. So he said... Don't announce to us again. Wait until you get the money. When you get the money, announce to us. And, you know, I, I, I can't disagree with that. Very true. Um, the story about, you know, <clears throat> on Daily Independent says Nigeria has made, um, it, or rather it has made Nigeria a big draw for global investors. I'm not sure how. That's why I said how. I pretty sure tell how. How has he made it? I mean, it's sort of similar to what Nesu Mike said, saying that uh, President Tidumbu has re, uh, rekindled hope in the hearts of Nigerians. You know, that... Uh, he, he has brought back the hope. When you are saying these sweeping statements, how? Don't just say, oh, the same thing again, our guest, our, our last caller said. 
Give us the numbers. Give us the stats. Give us the facts. All right. Elder Let's, David, uh, good morning. Me. Go ahead. Good morning, Elder David from Ali Moshoma. Good morning, Elder David. Thanks for calling. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. The assessment of the minister. In fact, I am very, very happy that the present government wants to assess those they have appointed within only one year. In fact, one of the best ministers among them is Umuahi, a very mature somebody. I see how he handled the matter. I follow it up. And that's all you are saying, that coastal road. If over the people that produce the oil in Nigeria are sharing today, yes, it's 1974. And he handled it with care. And everybody criticizing him. They are just opposition who are being used. Yes. And number two, we must praise this government. For the first time within one year, what they have done is more than 15 years of PDP. I always say it here. Now that I'm campaigning, even when the campaign was there 2021. Elder David, can you hear us? I will get the ticket. Elder David. Yes. Elder David, please hold on a bit. Elder David, can you hear us? Please give us, I mean, there are two things I want you to clarify. You've talked about how Dave Umahi is the one of the best ministers and that is very mature. He answered the questions maturely. But mature answers is not what makes a minister a great or the best minister. So give us examples or facts as to why you think he's the best minister. Also, you say that the, uh, the Tinumbu administration in one year has achieved more than what the Buhari ad administration achieved in eight years. I want you to also give us examples as to, to substantiate the statement that you've made. Oh. No. Elder David is not there to <coughs> answer. So. Anyone? Um, we have time for just maybe one or two more calls. Uh, share with us your thoughts on these stories. The government lists oil sector achievements, targets $20 billion investments this year, while, you know, of course, you know, IOCs, of course, are packing, are closing shop and leaving Nigeria. I'm not sure who exactly you know, is going to be replacing these ones, so you know, what kind of investment the president, the president is speaking about. Um, we did mention, of course, the post Sanusi re returns to the throne as MI of Kano. And uh, also, uh, this morning, I won't stop contesting for presidency as long as I'm healthy, says Atiku Abubakar. Tinubu should tell Nigerians true position of things, says Body George. Our final story is a defined newspaper this morning. It's on the Daily Trust, just a few stories. Um, Daily Trust newspaper this morning says, Salusi returns as MI of Kano. Um, Bichi, Rano, Karae, Gaia monarchs dethroned. Development, a bad omen, says Northern Elders. Dan Agundi challenges action in court. And we can also see at the bottom of the screen that Atiku declares interest in 2027 presidential election. Tidubo orders review of varsity governing councils list after protest. And also FCT residents to enjoy a free two-month ride on Abuja Metro Rail. And that's from, yes, on Wiki. Police arrest journalists in Abuja. I think we've also had really, really poor um, 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 statistics with um, the freedom of the press um, in, under this current administration in the last couple of years. National Assembly passes bill to return first, return, of course, our first national anthem. We spoke about this earlier. It was, of course, um, um, used between 1960 and 1978. Uh, before our eyes, all compatriots eventually was written and, uh, you know, brought in to replace Nigeria, we hail thee. And, of course, it has gotten mixed reactions. I did mention earlier that a lot of people are asking, you know, why was this necessary? You know, who, you know, thought that this was a great idea to deliberate in the House of Reps? Who or which of the House of Reps members went back home and saw his constituents and they all said to him, oh, please go back to the National Assembly and give us a new, you know, revert to the old national anthem. It's part of the renewed <coughs> hope. Do you understand? They are trying to renew the All hope right. of Nigerians. And this particular anthem that they are reverting to is renewing hope because these arise will come. Are you a compatriot? So it's not renewing hope, the yeah. current anthem. All right. Anyway, we have morning, Dapo Dapo. calling from Abuja. Good morning. Thanks for calling. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I really want to... I really want to say something about uh, what you asked uh, Edda David the other time. That uh, what uh, Renew Hope, what are people like David Umay and some, some ministers. You know, you know, one thing about uh, this country is that we love, we love from, the, from what I have experienced from the past government, 
What they used to do to us is that they know it's like a, it's like a monkey that is hungry. When they give him one banana, you feel like, oh, this man is trying for me. Meanwhile, he may be supposed to, so you are supposed to give him a bunch of bananas so that will take him for the rest of his life. But when they give us one banana, like, you feel like, oh, this government is good, this is good. But now we are having a government that comes and says, come, no. We don't want to do it the way they used to do before. We want to do it in such a way that let's lay a good foundation. Let's have a good foundation. This foundation that we want to is a lot of us. It's going to change many things. Maybe be, because before you eat, you eat three times in a day. This time around, you might eat twice. You might even eat one in a day. It just, it's just a matter of time. It's like a family. If a father comes back and says, come, children, what, what, the way I used to do before might not be like this because I need to build my whole house now. I can't be paying rent every year. I have to let you people know that, okay, the way you eat before will be different. Now, what do you expect the children to do? He has to. They have to. Go. But when the house is ready, they begin to come out. Ah, no, no, my father is the best father. in the house for us. He did this. That is what we are going to do. For example, there are many things that, like, for example, like many things that this government are doing that is, is not like before. Like, I've never seen since I've been in Nigeria since they bombed me. I've never seen a minister coming out to say, okay, you have to tell us what you have done in one year. We have never experienced such things. So we have to give them the kudos. And many of all these... Oh, it seems there's a glitch there. Yeah, but of... thank you very much uh, for calling that boy and sharing your thoughts with us there on uh, the stories that we've discussed so far. So any thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, every, everyone, you know, has, um, you know, freedom to express themselves, you know, and share their thoughts, you know, and, and, and every opinion is welcome. Um, you know, people would ag agree with him, there's others who also wouldn't agree with him. Um, yes, you know, it, sh it maybe should be commended, you know, that, um, you know, the, the, the ministers have been asked to share what they've achieved in the last one year, and I think everyone... You know, maybe you should point that out and say, okay, well, let's... let's. I, I certainly am I'm in support of it. I think it's great. It's good feedback. And I think it's great practice that we should have. And what that does, if it's done effectively, it's not eye service, if it's done effectively, what it does is if you're being appointed to come and work in any office, or you know, appointed to be a member of cabinet, you know, but, as you're coming in, that you're, you're going to be asked questions in one year. Yeah, but the thing is... I still don't see how useful it is if there's no actual metrics with which we're rating these ministers and their performance. If the president is not going to be able to say to any of them that, well, you've had one year, is this all you've done? If the president is not going to be able to say, okay, well, your ministry has had, you know, this amount of money channeled to it in the last one which year. Which goes back is this to what I've always said. all achieved in that one year? This goes back to what I've always said in the sense, uh, in the area of our screening, that I, I think that it's time for us to review you know, our screening process for ministers. It's important to know that you're screening this person for this office. They know the office you're screening them for. They can go and do their research. Check out that industry. See what the problems are. And see, imagine Ade Labu, for example, not knowing that he's coming to be minister of power, just being screened, and then coming there. And that's, that's what ends and up happening. Assigned, assigned, you know, assigned to power. He doesn't know anything about power. Yeah. So we are putting square pegs in, in round holes. Let people know ahead of time so that if they cannot work in that capacity, they'll say, ah, thank exactly. you very much, Joe, then, but I can't uh, work here. I, uh, all right. And, and, and then also, um, when you say that this is all you've achieved, you know, is the president going to go back home and say, okay, well, I think this person has failed. He should be fired. So how do the, we mark them? I, exactly. I see, I, I see that completely. You know, um, good morning, Paul. Go ahead. Yeah, good morning. I just want to make my contribution on the $20 billion, which you just talked about, uh, coming into Nigeria. Um, definitely, um, some of the policies that the government are making is actually... A contraproductive in the sense that you 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 keep floating the exchange rate of this country and we have not gotten to a point where we have developed ourselves where all the indicators are checkmated now where you keep floating we have demand on supply that people because of the high rate of unemployment in the country people are looking for extra source of income and then demands for jobs are brought are there so the narrow keep moving outside to the outside of this country because people want to survive so when the narrow is floated 
the fact that every day CBN keep changing, keep changing their policy interest rate, and it's not favoring us because the pressure on the naira will increase. So why don't we operate the fixed uh, uh, exchange rate so that forces and demand does not really dictate to our, our currency where everything day in day out we keep having cost of goods being be, be, be shooting up just like the dango they just announced that he's going to increase the the the, 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 the price of gasoline because why why the, the, the exchange rate is changing so i believe now that we are yet to get to that but why can't we have a stable uh, exchange rate where policies can be people Companies can be able to project into the future and know what is really uh, uh, going to be what they're going to invest, bringing in. So I am advocating because of the high rate of employment and the flexible exchange rate, it's going to be very difficult for investors to even come in and also to make the economy much better. Thank you very much. Uh, for this morning's review of the papers, thank you to all our callers. We'll go on a quick break and when we come back, we're entering into another conversation this morning on the show. Welcome back. Now, four years after Mohamed Sanusi II was dethroned as the Emir of Kano, Governor Abba Yusuf on Thursday reinstated him to the throne. This reinstatement occurred immediately after Governor Yusuf signed the Kano State Emirate Council Repeal Bill 2024 into law. The new legislation replaces the 2019 Kano State Emirate Council law and dissolves the Emirate Councils established by former Governor Abdullahi Ganduje. On a quick turn of events, a federal high court sitting in Kano has granted an ex parte order stopping Governor Abba Kabir Yusuf of Kano from reinstating Amai um, Sanusi II pending the de determination of a substantive suit filed against the reinstatement. Late on Thursday, the court directed all parties involved to, re uh, to maintain the status quo pending the determination of the suit filed by Sarkin Dawaki uh, Baba and Aminu Baba Dan Agundi. We're joined this morning uh, by multimedia um, uh, journalist, uh, who, of course, is going to be joining us to share his uh, thoughts with us on these stories. And, of course, the latest story concerning uh, the reinstatement, uh, Mr. Olokoba. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Marvin. Um, I mean, first of all, you know, many have described this as politics that played out when he was, you know, dethroned at first by Abdullahi Ganduje. Um, what are your thoughts on how things have played out you know, since that time till now, and of course, what initially led to his uh, dethronement as the Emir of Kano. Thank you. We should look at the matter in specifics and in general. The attitude we have towards that institution uh, is not uh, fair, and if we continue like this, we will become a country with no identity. These are the custodian of our identity and of our culture. Uh, the father of Sanusi was also dethroned. And when he, he resisted that banishment, uh, it's a good thing. Banishment is a custody, protective custody. For the reason we have taken the office, maybe people some may want to come after you when you left. But we thought it that if I am not the king, I should be able to work uh, freely. And those are the new things that the institution must embrace. But because British came and shot them out of governance. And that is the reason why today we seem not to understand who we are, because that's the custodian. We are just 64 people, 64 year old people. If a role has been created for the institution, we understand each other better. Of course, there were wars when uh, we don't, were not together, but we have a platform where you sort out issues. But you show them out and see the way you are relating with them. There's a, there will be a confusion in Kano because the people there who might want to follow issues presented to them by the former governor and by the new governor will have a confusion. And that is uh, reflecting on the statement of the northern leaders who said that uh, it, it, it's creating more crisis for them. So for us as a people, we have to tell the political class to stay out of that institution. It's not important to us than to be toying with that. And that's why you see our children don't seem to understand who we are. They see foreign culture and say that they, in the, they don't behave like that. We are supposed to tell them, this is Africa. We don't behave like that too in Africa. This yeah. our, that's our culture. It is an inheritance for black people to take care of their 
transparent and it's working. Chinese is studying the model now of African model where you see it as a responsibility to take care of the junior ones, yeah. your father and your mother. So Kano is important for uh, uh, the elders in Kano to wade into it because that's a capacity of dividing the, uh, the city into fragments. When that city was divided into five by Ganduje, yes. I knew it was going to create more problems for, for him. The Emirates don't operate the way yeah, modern, but, but, modern, but, but, modern... Was that strongly politically motivated? Were, were there, do you think that there were issues between Ganduje and uh, Amar Sanusi? Yes, Sanusi is playing a role we expect other kings and Obas and Emirates will be playing. Only of is doing something similar. We know someone from the East and someone from Ijola. You know, I spoke about a regional mechanism of sorting out issues. Then they have that kind of prominence. You should, a boy of Lagos should be able to tell Chinobu then a few things which he listened to. He told personally a few things which is very beneficial to him. The same thing about the announcement will do. So they have a permanent gaze on their city, on their people. And they know their peculiarity, they know the weakness, they know the strength of that. So when they say something is an institution, contrary to the belief that a, a ceremonial by queen of England, there's no ceremonial. There is no prime minister that does not enjoy the endorsement of the king or the, as the case may be or the, uh, as in, in Britain. But because the conscience is unwritten, you won't understand, you won't read it anywhere. He has a, an important role to play. In fact, he is one of the most important human beings in the world, if not the most important. He requires visa to travel to no part of the world. That's where they kept their own institution. And you, you come here and say that uh, Abba should not have issue on. People understand who you are, who understand your parent, the great grandparent. Where is you in our schools today? So they have custody of it, of, us, of some of these things, the way you do, the way you are to issue. So yeah. we need to ask the political class to stay clear of certain things. In fact, that institution should be independent. The more we put hand into it, the more there's a confusion of who we are. We kill the Buddha. All of us kill the Buddha because we know the guy that was killed in Kano. No, I, I, I know. Yeah. She didn't understand the country she's living in. She said, no, don't talk about religion. You don't want me to know a lie I should not cross when I'm talking to you. I should know. There should be religion in a public issue or, or engagement so that you will know where to stop and where you can uh, uh, condone me that, okay, but there are things are, as Christian that you may not want to. So, when you come to, when you get to Kano, there are traditions that you must understand. There are things you must know. It's been eroded now. In Kano, in Portacourt, in River, in Elori, in Oyo, in Ife, in, it's been eroded. And it's because you did not allow this system to play their role. So, for political class who turn this thing into another tool of winning voting, we must stop them early enough. Kano did something very, 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 very wrong. By dipping it, it's adding to you. Yeah. This other guy, too, I hope is going to obey all righteousness in returning Sanusi. I want Sanusi back. If uh, they ask me, I don't know, Sanusi, but I want him back. I want him to start playing the role he's been playing. It's understanding about our economy. It's understanding about the Nigerian issues. We want him. We want people who are also knowledgeable, who are there sure to do similar things. And that's why, when you see anybody disrespecting that institution, Nigeria will rise. Yeah. You know what we did to Ambassador? Yeah. All right. Okay. We want to mobilize to Baden, to, uh, to Abekuta, and to be assertive that, uh, in fact, I was part of the people who wrote, who had a con press conference that all the titles belonging to Ambassador, that should be taken back from him. And he should never be called a chief in Yoruba land if you want to be against in Yoruba land anyway. So that's to tell you the importance of uh, that institution. So going forward now, I don't know whether the governor will go ahead with the. Uh, what he wants to I mean, do there's a court, the court case, case, you know, asking that they maintain status quo. Uh -huh. So, so, so the the lawyer will have to understand whether such matters can be restrained based on court. Maybe the governor has that power to set aside the court. I don't know. The law must speak to that. But it is very, very, very important to bring the barricade around this institution. It's important for us. In another hundred years, we, are, we will end up becoming a country without identity. There is no country in the world that can prosper with the borrow culture. The only people that attempt to, are the black people. We are the people trying to do that. We are too want, who want to lose our identity. People don't lose identity. We are not supposed to lose identity. That's who you are. And this is the institution yeah. that can put you on that path. No matter the democracy you practice. Yeah. Chinese says that uh, 2,000 years of year of this culture, we can't do it away. We will do democracy. It's not election every four years. That's not democracy. It's, a, it's, a, it's peculiar to the West. 
India share something like that. It's only the African people that are saying that throw away your institutions because they want to have an identity yeah. again. But I, I want you to, you know, because in the interest of time, you know, Governor Abba Yusuf, you know, and, um, you know, his decision to reinstate him, you know, what do you think that, you know, more may have uh, prompted that decision? Well, if it is uh, uh, the process that led to his uh, detriment, is inappropriate. It's appropriate for the governor to bring him back. But I know very well that know what the political class are. There's a political interest in it. But in the interest of the political class, you must also look at our interests as people too. And the interest of the people is that uh, Sanusi, who to me, if he's uh, cheated, this is the time for him to be redressed. I can see what is happening in Kano now, which is very, very unlike. They could have been uprising by now. Yeah. But there's a confusion in their mind because the people of Sanusi in Kano, and the guy that left maybe has done something to, to also impress people. So it's divided now. That's not good for us. There are things that political should not be playing politics with. One of it is that institution. So the governor should proceed with what he wants to do. Give any respect to court order, they go to court and sort it out. But if I have the right to still go, it should still go. But he needs to do follow you so that someone after him will also come back to do similar things. So he might get anybody. He's trying to reverse what the former governor has also done. Because the way it, the, the, the society is coined, is coined in such a way that the grip of that institution yeah. on the entire city is good for us. It's not a governance where smaller, smaller sectors perform better than what we have today, where the president is or that, or that's why we have in this challenge. But divide the country to a smaller sector for governance is good. But institution is not like that. But particularly when you Traditional have... Traditional institutions. Yeah, but particularly when you have similar language, similar lifestyle, similar values. So presiding over that kind of kingdom is an aberration if you begin to divide, if you are dividing local yeah. government. It's not proper and it's not correct. And that's why their role should be assigned outside what we are. Yeah. That's why we call for restructuring. Those are part of the issues that will be addressed. And that's why in Jonathan's conference, it was recommended yeah. that we should be assigned. That, that, that's even derogatory that they should be assigned a rule. It's not, it, sh it, should be, it, sh it should remove their exercise. A local government uh, officer, uh, chairman, is who, who can remove Sanusi and any emir any, any or king in Nigeria now. Yeah. They should reassign a rule, create a rule for them, so that African will come back to that threshold where they say that uh, one of the richest culture in the world is the culture of Africa yeah. was gradually I mean, you know, in the next couple of days, we would we'll see how these things turn out. Um, Sanusi, uh, Lamido Sanusi, from CBN governor to where he is today. Of course, for, you know, started as a banker, became CBN go a governor. Um, I remember that there was some controversy even in Good Luck Abella, Jonathan's government, yeah. you know, with, the, with, the, with him. And then eventually became MIF Kano, was deposed, now brought back. It's just so much. But we'll see how things turn out with this new court case, you know, asking that they maintain status quo. Abba Yusuf, Abdullah Gandujay, too many uh, details. Thanks for stopping by and for it's sharing your thoughts on this uh, important you. topic. It's, uh, here we wrap up of conversations for this week. We'll be back here again next week for Breakfast Central. Remember that Breakfast Extra comes up uh, tomorrow uh, uh, with uh, Judith and Mazzino. So we wish you guys a very, very beautiful weekend. Uh, see you on Monday. I am Osalgi Ogbawa.